going to invite you to turn uh, to the first chapter of the Gospel of John. Um, as you'll hear much more about next week, um, next week is the first Sunday of Advent. Um, and this is one of those years, it's not always the case, is that there's a Sunday between Thanksgiving and when we start Advent. Often Advent starts the very first Sunday after um, uh, Thanksgiving. So today I kind of want to do the introduction to the introduction. Advent um, uh, has to do with the uh, anticipating and the waiting for the coming of Christ. And so today I want to talk a little bit about the anticipation and the waiting for the waiting um, for Jesus, um, which really should be an everyday thing, not just a seasonal thing. Um, and, you know, some of you may be glad we have an extra week before we jump fully into the Christmas season. You'll know we've gotten a jump start. You'll see the Chris Mon tree. We're going to talk some about that tree with the children uh, next week, but we'll have more decorations, which means it'll be a busier week, and many of you probably will be doing those kind of things at your home and, and maybe businesses and schools and, and things like that. But I want to step back today and just um, talk a minute about the fullness of Christ. And we're going to read in a minute, we're going to read almost the full, what's called the prologue of the Gospel of John. We're going to read more than just those three verses that I have there, uh, but we're going to concentrate right at the end of what's called uh, the prologue. Um, but before we do that, um, uh, this idea of being full, uh, many of you this week have experienced extreme fullness, have you not? Um, you got up from a table and you were like, man, I am full. And somebody may have asked you, are you full? Did you save room for dessert? There's something satisfying about fullness. In fact, some of us have found out it's not so satisfying to be over full in that. But when we talk about the fullness of Christ, it is that we have been filled to what the scriptures say, to the measure of all the fullness of Christ, which means we've been given out of the abundance that there's this never-ending reservoir of love and grace and all the things of God that have been given to us in Jesus Christ. But it's always given to us at just the right time and just the right amounts. And we never doubt whether there will be enough. In fact, there ought to be, not be a time in our lives where we doubt that it is enough for us. And yet, we live a life where often, we, we talked about this as we studied the book of Ecclesiastes recently, is our temptation is to substitute things of this earth for what ought to only be the place of Christ, and we could experience what we might call dissatisfaction or an emptiness. It's what the writer of Ecclesiastes would call vanity or meaninglessness. Um, and why do we do that? And those substitutes are never good enough. Now, you may have been um, a, a victim, we might say, of this, but cheap knockoffs aren't the same as the good stuff, right? Kids know this when it comes to toys. I bet for a birthday or uh, for Christmas one year, you had a well-meaning, sometimes it's a, a grandparent that don't know the latest trends for children. They think they're getting the right thing. So maybe there was a time where uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were popular um, and you got the new style Ninja Tortoise instead of the Ninja Turtles. Or maybe... Uh, you were a big fan of, of uh, Godzilla. They've been making Godzilla uh, movies since before uh, any of us here were born. And instead of Godzilla, you got Big Fella. Anybody get a Big Fella any of those times? That's just not the same, is it? Big Fella and Godzilla are not the same thing. Well, superheroes are the worst for this. Um, did you ever ask for Superman and you got Special Man? That doesn't have the same ring to it. Or even if it sounds the same, it doesn't mean the same. What if you got Superman? S-O-U-P-E-R. Um, and I, don't, I, I was laughing when I saw that picture. I don't know what the nemesis of Superman with a U, with a O U would be. Um, probably uh, his arch ne nemesis, Gaspacho, would be the, the villain in that story because, um, you know, cold soup is always evil, we might say. What about Spider-Man? Is that just as good? Um, if you were to receive Spider-Man and not Spider-Man, and it goes on, what if you got Super Bat instead of Batman? And some more recent ones, some of you may have even played on your phone that game, Angry Birds. Um, you may have received this gift. It's hard to read on this package, but Ill-Tempered Birds. 
doesn't have exactly the same ring. And maybe more recently, too, if you were a, a, a fan of Harry Potter and you received the little wizard doll, um, doesn't exactly, even the hair color doesn't match um, on that. Well, all those things are cheap knockoffs, and when it's a toy, some of you might say a toy is a toy is a toy. Does it really matter? But we live in a world that often we try to live in a world of knockoffs or what ought to be authentically only coming from Jesus Christ. When we try to find satisfaction, we try to find fullness in this life anywhere other than in Jesus Christ, it's uh, by nature dissatisfying um, and also, according to the truth of Scripture, it's deadly to go that route. You can't substitute that. I remember, uh, y'all know I grew up uh, in and around a pharmacy. All of my family just about are pharmacists. And there's certain uh, uh, drugs, and you who are physicians here would know this, that it's fine to have a generic drug, but there's certain things that um, have to be so precise that you don't dare take a substitute. And even the prescription pads of this day say, dispense as written only. Don't give me any substitutes on this. It has to be this because it has to be right. That's the kind of fullness we want to experience in Christ. And we don't want just a partial fullness. Unfortunately, I think a lot of us in the Christian life feel like sometimes not only do we get cheap knockoffs to try to fill ourselves with it, but we also don't ever feel like we've been filled up to the measure that we want. We haven't experienced Christ in the way that we want to. And there's no way to really check that by looking each other up and down. Some of you may have read, like I did this week, the humorous story about a tradition that's going to take place at Christmas time within the royal family um, in England. Um, is that it came out that one of the historians said there, since the time of Prince or King Edward VII in the early 1900s, after the Christmas meal and before the Christmas meal, the royal family individually is weighed. So before you go in for the meal, they weigh you on an ancient um, kind of antique scale. You go in, you have your meal, and then you come back out, and they want to be sure that you're well fed. Would y'all sign up for that? I was thinking, you know, there was a new addition to the royal family this year. And in this report, it, it said that her mother, the, now the mother-in-law of Prince Harry, is going to be invited. Her first royal meal, she's going to be weighed before and after the meal. Well, there's no spiritual weight for that, is there? How do we know if we've experienced the fullness of Christ? I think the only way to do that is to know the fullness of Christ, know the true fullness of Christ without any kind of cheap substitutes. So what does this prologue to John, these few verses, say about Christ and his coming? Let's read this, and most of this is very familiar to you, I'm sure. This is the beginning of John's gospel, and this is John's nativity scene. John doesn't talk about the, uh, the room, with, uh, no room at the end, and Mary and Joseph, and the baby born in a manger. This is John's description of the coming of Jesus. He takes a much bigger view of it and doesn't tell the details of the birth narrative, but talks about the impact of God himself coming to earth. John chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light but came to bear witness about the light. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. 
Thanks be to God for his word to us today. Um, I want to concentrate really just on that last verse in conjunction with verse 14. 14 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, And it says that we have seen him full of grace and truth. And verse 16 says, and from his fullness, we all have received grace upon grace. So what is it about Christ's fullness? Well, first, let me say just a word about that word fullness. Now, the fact that Jesus came in bodily form is one of the extraordinary things that the Bible teaches us. In fact, if you're like me and you grew up in and around church and you've heard that so often, the Christmas story, so much centers around um, God who became flesh. Emmanuel, God with us, it becomes somewhat rote and routine. But think about this, is that we're talking about what theologically is called the incarnation, the bodily form of God himself. Jesus, who was God, became flesh. And Tim Keller says of this, of all the things that Christianity proclaims, this is the most staggering Now think about that. Um, I know some people might debate that the virgin birth, the resurrection, some of the miracles that that Jesus did, maybe even some of the Old Testament things that took place. But if this is true, and the Bible purports it to be true, in fact it demands that it's true, if God himself came to earth and took on the form of a man, he says it's staggering. If there is a God and he has become human, why would you not find it in why would you find it incredible that he would do miracles, pay for the sins of the world, or rise from the dead? It's one of those things. If you believe Jesus was God himself, why would you have a hard time believing in anything else that the Bible claims about Jesus? Well, here he says he's full of grace and truth, and from that fullness of Christ, we get Grace upon grace. Well, this word fullness um, is, a, is a Greek word that emphasizes completeness. It means full to the top. It's gone all the way. It's not just a partial thing. It doesn't mean that we've just got something from Jesus. It's that we've got everything from Jesus and nothing is lacking. Here's what John MacArthur says on that one word. He says, as a result of the fall, that is the entering of sin into the world, man is in a sad state of incompleteness. Now think about that. It is because of the brokenness of this world. We're never complete without Jesus Christ. He is, a, he is spiritually, talking about man, spiritually incomplete because he is totally out of fellowship with God. It's an important concept for us to know. We will never be complete. We will never be full without Jesus Christ because without Jesus Christ, we'll never be in right relationship with God. Man is morally incomplete because he lives outside of God's will. He's mentally incomplete because he doesn't know the ultimate truth. At salvation, um, John MacArthur says, believers become partakers of the divine nature and are made complete. Believers are spiritually complete because they have fellowship with God. They are morally complete because they recognize the authority of God's will and they are mentally complete because they know the truth about the ultimate reality. What he's getting at there is that every part of our lives is incomplete outside of Christ and in order to be complete in those things we have to be in relationship with Jesus Christ by faith Our lives are changed. So what is this fullness that it talks about? And I think just from these few uh, short verses, primarily just these two we've looked at here, we can see these things about the fullness of Christ. First, it's a divine and an eternal um, fullness as opposed to a a, a earthly or worldly kind of fullness. Uh, We were told in this prologue that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word was Jesus Christ, and it says the word was with God and the word was God at creation. And so Jesus always has been and always will be. And when he came, we got to see a kind of fullness that is not present here on this earth. We got to see a glimpse of the eternal up close. In fact, in Colossians, Paul writes that in Jesus, for in him, talking about Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. John makes this case, Paul makes this case, the Bible makes this case is when we see Jesus, we got to see God up close. 
And I always say this at, at Christmas, this uh, verse, 1, 4, John 1, 14, and the message in that paraphrase, I love the, uh, uh, the paraphrase that he gives to get the message to us. It says that God became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. I like that. That God wanted us to get an even up, more up-close view than we already have. Yes, we can look out at the beauty of nature and creation and um, in the form of a newborn baby. And we see all kinds of things of God in the beauty of this earth. But we see the perfection of God, the fullness of God only in Jesus Christ in this earthly world. And the scriptures have recorded so much of Jesus, his thoughts, his attitudes, the way he interacted with people, the things that he taught. All those things show us something of the fullness of God. And it shows the divinity of Jesus himself and the eternality of what Jesus was bringing to earth here. And that's an important part of the fullness that we need to experience. Don't substitute those cheap knockoffs for earthly, temporal things, but only accept the divine, the eternal fullness of God that's only in Jesus Christ. It's also a loving fullness. Uh, some of you experienced this this week. We could have went around any table anywhere, and if enough, proof, uh, enough food was provided, we could have been full. But there's another kind of fullness that many of you experienced this week around a loving Thanksgiving table that comes primarily from friends and family and loved one. That when food is prepared out of love and it's enjoyed in joyous fellowship, it's a different kind of fullness. It's not just the filling of the stomach, but it's the filling of our spirit when we interact together. The kind of fullness that comes in Jesus Christ is a family kind of fullness. It's a loving kind of fullness. It's a fatherly love. The Bible paints the picture of God. God is our heavenly Father, and the fullness of Jesus Christ is the demonstration of his love for us. I always say this, you know, God could have remained a distant God intentionally and said, if anybody wants a fullness, a completeness, wants relationship with me, you can seek me out and come find me. But that's not what our loving heavenly Father did. He pursued us. He loved us enough to come near to us and to demonstrate in bodily human form what he was like. And we got to, to see, and even in Jesus' day, people got to touch and rub elbows with God himself. And so we know how God interacted with religious people, with prostitutes, with beggars, with lepers, with all kinds of people. We know how God treats people. We know how God loves people. And he does so in dying for his own people. So it's a divine and an eternal fullness, a loving fullness. And this ver these verses told us too that it's a glorious fullness. The incarnation, the coming of Jesus in flesh revealed so much of the glory of God. Again, we got to see God's love, God's compassion, God's desire for reconciliation with his people in Jesus Christ. In a way that words wouldn't do. When um, I, I said that during the pastoral prayer this morning, God made him, Jesus, to be sin for us in order that we might become the righteousness of God. That's how much God loves us, is that he gave his one and only son, came to this earth, lived a perfect life, and then died, not just for us to demonstrate his love, but because he had to in order to pay the penalty for our sins. That's a glorious kind of fullness that comes only through Jesus Christ. When we know who Jesus was and what his ministry was here on earth, we see the fullness of the glory of God in all that he is. And one of the hallmarks of God's glory is his graciousness to his people. I love that this says, and from his fullness, what is it specific? We could list all the attributes of God here, but it mentions one because it kind of encapsulates all of them. From his fullness, we have received what? Grace upon grace. It's an abundant supply that will never be exhausted or diminished. It doesn't um, slow from pouring out to a trickle ever. It's grace upon grace. It keeps coming. In fact, one translation will say it's grace piled on grace. We can be truly filled with the fullness of Christ when we know the grace upon grace, that never-ending flow. J.C. Ryle says this, All who believe in Jesus have received an abundant supply of all that our souls need out of the full store that resides in him for his people. It is from Christ and Christ alone that all our spiritual wants have been supplied. 
One person compared this to stepping into a flowing river. If you stood on the banks of the river and you look, it just looks like water. And it looks relatively unchanged. But if you step into it, you experience the flow of that water. And you're never in the same water and it never ends. It continues to come. That's grace upon grace. That yes, there's an initial experience of God's grace, but it keeps coming and coming and coming. And literally washes over us like water. That's to know the fullness. That's to know Christ as he really is. That's to know God as he really is. Is to know his grace upon grace. And finally, it is a true fullness. And I've really said this already. We can attempt to fill ourselves with other things. In fact, it's in starting in the Thanksgiving season that we start substituting food and activities and decorations and gifts and all those kinds of things. But we can only truly be filled in an authentic way by the fullness of Christ. Uh, Probably most of you have heard at some point, you may not know who it comes from, but Blaise Pascal, the famous French mathematician and philosopher, spoke of the God-shaped vacuum or the God-shaped hole that's in every person. There's a void in the life of every person which can only be filled by God. The true fullness fits in that vacuum, in that hole, to attempt to fill it with things or Fame or culture or whatever is of no avail. Only when Christ Jesus fills that place can we be truly satisfied, can we be truly fulfilled. And as I got to the end of this sermon, I thought, that's a real Ecclesiastes kind of message, isn't it? Right here in the first chapter of John is, don't accept the earthly substitutes for Jesus Christ. Only he can truly satisfy. Everything else is vanity and meaninglessness. And I'll close with this. It's at Christmas that the fullness of Christ is on display, even in a secular world that we live in. Soon, if you haven't already, you'll be somewhere, the grocery store at a mall or or, uh, maybe even on a town square somewhere, and there'll be Christmas music playing in the background. And because you know where much of that music comes from, it's pointing to our Savior, Jesus Christ, and it points us to the fullness of Christ. Um, It will remind us that even in a secular world, Jesus' presence is here and his fullness is offered to us. This is what Tim Keller says, and we're going to close with a hymn um, with this idea to point us to the Advent season. This is what he says. Every year, our increasingly Western society becomes more unaware of of its historical roots, many of which are the fundamentals of the Christian faith. Tim Keller is a pastor in Manhattan in New York. Um, what some would con, uh, kind of would be the quintessential secular place. And yet he points out that during this Christmas season, there's lots of signs of this fullness of Christ. He says, once a year at Christmas, these basic truths become a bit more accessible to an enormous audience. At countless gatherings, concerts, parties, and other events, even when most participants are non-religious, the essentials of the faith can sometimes be visible. As an example, he says, let's ask some questions of the famous Christmas carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, heard in malls and grocery stores and on street corners. And even in one of the quintessential uh, Christmas films, It's a Wonderful Life, the movie closes with a group of people singing Hark the Herald Angels Sing right near the end of that movie. It's It feels, and again, you'll hear this song in shopping centers and malls and places like that, What does it say? Well, it answers this question, who is Jesus? It says, he is the everlasting Lord. He is from highest heaven and comes down as the offspring of the virgin's womb. What did he come to do? His mission is to see God and sinners reconciled. How did he accomplish it? He lays his glory by that man may no more die. How can this life be ours? Through the inward spiritual regeneration so radical that as we have seen it, it's called the second birth in that song. With brilliant economy of style, Tim Keller says, the carol gives us a summary of the entire Christian teaching. 
I hope as we go through this season, next Sunday we'll begin singing some of the songs of Advent and Christmas. I want you to see there's some of the richest hymns and songs that we have at our disposal that speak of the fullness of Christ. God himself come to earth to reconcile man to himself and all the glory of God on display. The divine fullness, the loving fullness, the glorious, gracious, and true fullness of God found in Jesus Christ. Let's embrace this season. Let's not rebel against those things. When you're in that hustle and bustle and so many uh, non-religious activities are going on, maybe there in the background the truth of the fullness of Christ is on display in one way or another. Let us be encouraged in that. Let us live in light of that. And more than anything, let us be filled with the fullness of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, it is with great joy... Uh, that we know and love your son, Jesus Christ. It's, it's with gratitude that we have received the gift of the king who died for me. And I pray that in this season, um, that it wouldn't be lost on us, the gloriousness of the fullness of Christ, the grace upon grace given to us, to us through Jesus Christ. I pray that we would know that fullness, we would live in that fullness, uh, and we would proclaim it to a world around us. We thank you, we love you, we praise you this day because of it. In Jesus' name, amen.